My name is Rob, and I'm writing to you from the outskirts of Whitefish, Montana. I've been living here for over a decade, enjoying the solitude of this mountainous wilderness. I spend most of my time outdoors, hunting, fishing, hiking, and observing the local fauna. A couple of days ago, I was up in the mountains looking for a fishing spot I've been told about by a local guide. I had packed up my gear and was setting up for a quiet afternoon by a promising looking creek. The sun was beginning to set, casting long shadows over the forest. As I was setting up my fishing line, I started to notice an odd sound. At first, I thought it was just the wind rustling through the trees, but then I noticed it had a rhythmic pattern to it. It was like a low flapping sound. Having spent so much time in the wilderness, I recognized that this sound didn't belong. Then, the temperature seemed to drop rapidly. It was an unusually cold evening for June, and there was this strange odor in the air metallic, almost like the smell of blood. I remember feeling a chill run down my spine, something I haven't felt since my days in the military. Suddenly, about 20 feet from me, I saw something emerge from the shadows. It was about 5 to 6 feet tall with an uncannily human-like body. The most startling part, though, were these enormous wings. They were large and leathery, like those of a bat and about the same size as its body. The creature was draped in black feathers that seemed to absorb the fading light, making it hard to make out any definitive features. But its eyes, they were large and reflective, a deep, unsettling red. It didn't seem to have a face, just these piercing red eyes. This encounter sent a wave of primal fear through me. It wasn't just the way it looked. It was the feeling it gave off like I was in the presence of a predator. I was frozen in place. My heartbeat pounding in my ears as I stared back at those glowing eyes. As quickly as it appeared, the creature retracted its wings and receded back into the shadows. The sound of wings flapping echoed for a moment before disappearing completely. I found myself alone again the only sound being my own quickened breath in the babbling creek nearby. I spent the next few minutes just standing there, trying to slow my breathing and gather my thoughts. I felt like I'd come face to face with a nightmare, a chilling encounter with something I couldn't explain. Eventually, I mustered up the courage to retrieve my scattered fishing gear. Every sound in the forest seemed magnified, my senses on high alert. It was as if I'd been plunged into a heightened state of awareness. I considered the idea of spending the night up there, as was my original plan, but the thought of encountering that creature again was too unsettling. The van was about a mile away, parked by the side of a dirt road. The journey back to the van was one of the longest I've ever made. Every rustle in the brush, every snap of a twig sent a jolt of adrenaline through my body. But I made it back locked the doors, and drove home without looking back. In the safety of my home, I started to reflect on the encounter. I couldn't shake off the image of the creature's red eyes and the ominous feeling of dread it evoked. I spent hours researching, looking for anything that could possibly explain what I saw, but found no satisfactory answers. I've decided to share my story with you in hopes that someone else might have had similar encounter or could shed some light on what this creature could be. I haven't been back to the creek since, and I've been having trouble sleeping haunted by the memory of that night. In spite of the fear, I find myself driven by a strange curiosity. I feel like I've encountered a piece of the unknown, something that defies our understanding of the natural world. My name is Alex, and before the encounter, I was just an average guy a little interested in the unknown, but nothing too much. Ever since then, it feels like I've shifted, you know? It's like my perspective on everything has changed. I was never one to dwell on the abstract or the supernatural. I was more a facts and figures kind of guy. If you couldn't explain it with numbers and charts, it didn't hold much weight for me. But this encounter, it really shook me. It's like a veil was lifted and I found myself questioning things. I'd always taken for granted. Suddenly, the world felt bigger, scarier, but also more intriguing than it had ever been. It was as if I had been given a sneak peek into a dimension I never knew existed. I was at my uncle's place helping him some renovation work. He lives pretty much in the middle of nowhere, 
surrounded by dense forest. Not exactly my cup of tea, but family is family. My uncle's property. It's a good chunk of land, mostly forested. It's quiet, peaceful to a point, but also kind of eerie. In a way, it feels like you're stepping back in time when you go out there, with the forest stretching in all directions, untouched by the modern world. Not to mention, the nearest neighbor is miles away. During the day, you could appreciate the solitude and the beauty of nature, but at night, the isolation could feel a bit unsettling. It's just you in the wilderness. And as I found out, maybe not just you. I didn't know much about local legends or anything. I'd heard stories from my uncle about weird stuff happening in the woods, but I thought he was just trying to scare me, you know? Typical stuff. I wasn't a believer, I suppose you could say. Then, one evening, while I was taking a break, I saw something. At first, I thought it was just a person, hunched over. But as I looked closer, I saw it wasn't. It was pale, almost sickly looking. Not ghost white or anything, just off. It was on all fours, but its body was oddly proportioned, like it was supposed to stand upright. It was disturbingly quick, too. It moved like nothing I'd ever seen. It was strange, to say the least. It was as if it was struggling against its own form, the way it moved. Imagine watching a person trying to run on all fours, but with a speed that seemed unnatural. It was just not right, and the paleness of its skin was almost like a light in the dark, like moonlight reflected on a calm lake. It gave off an uncanny vibe. Something inside me screamed that this was very wrong, definitely not something that belonged in the world as I knew it. I'm not gonna lie, Donovan, I was terrified. I froze. I couldn't move. All I could do was watch as it clicked, the noise echoing around the silent woods. Its face, those large black eyes, no nose, just this gaping mouth, like something out of a nightmare. But it didn't approach me. It just looked at me, then turned and sprinted off into the woods. When our eyes met, it felt like time stopped. I remember the chill running down my spine my heartbeat echoing in my ears. It didn't advance towards me. Instead, it just sat there clicking. The sound was alien. It had this weird rhythm, almost hypnotic. Its face haunts me to this day. Those enormous black eyes felt like they were staring right into my soul. The lack of a nose and that open mouth, it was something straight out of a horror movie. But it was real, as real as the cold beer in my hand. And then, as abruptly as it had appeared, it vanished into the dense forest, leaving me alone with my shock and fear. After it was gone, it took me a few minutes to collect myself. Once I got back inside, I didn't go back out, not until the sun was up. The next day, I packed my bags and left. Couldn't stay there knowing that. Thing was out there. From then on, I was more cautious. More aware, I suppose. And that's the real kicker, isn't it? How something like that can make you see things differently. After the creature had gone, I sat there in silence, my mind racing. I felt a sudden urge to pack my bags and leave, but I forced myself to stay put until dawn. It was a long night, filled with every creak and rustle magnified by my heightened senses. When I finally left the next day, the forest no longer seemed peaceful. It felt different, charged with a new sense of awareness. It was a harsh lesson about the mysteries that our world still holds, a reminder that there's so much we don't know. The experience made me more cautious, more observant, not just of the wilderness, but of life itself. It's funny how a single encounter can jolt you out of your usual path, make you question, and in a way, open your eyes to the possibilities. It changed me. It made me. More curious, more open to the unexplained. I work at this summer home community in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. Best I can describe it is that it's like a nice neighborhood that's kind of like a resort with a swimming pool, golf, hiking, trails, spa, and clubhouse. It's the opposite of a snowbird community because it's completely inaccessible in the winter due to the snow in the mountains. I work there during the summer when all the residents are around. 
but I'm the only one who also stays through the winter, basically making sure the place isn't ransacked when no one else is there. I live in a small house and I don't do much except wander around in my pickup with the snowplow attachment, just making my presence known. I bring up supplies for the whole winter and just stay from October until early April or so alone. It's not as bad as it sounds since the satellite TV and internet work pretty well. I can communicate with the outside world. I just can't really get any goods I need during those months, so I have to plan in advance. I have a big chest freezer, but I also eat a lot of canned food. I do what I can, but the food does get a bit boring. My first winter up there was really quiet. Nothing much happened. I watched a lot of TV and ate a lot of chili and chips. This past winter, though, something odd happened. I usually try to walk around the neighborhood at least once a day, not just because of my job, but also just to get out. I would go nuts in the house all day. Unless it's a snowstorm, of course. One of the first days I was there, I went out. It hadn't snowed yet. Since it was just October, but everyone was gone since you really never know when snow might come. They go ahead and close the community just in case. I still had a few winterizing things to do like check on the pool's foundation. I headed down to the pool to do that, walking just for the exercise. I started looking around the pool when I heard this strange noise coming from the nearby woods. The community itself is all groomed and landscaped, but the woods really isn't that far away. It is the mountains after all. So a few yards behind the grassy area next to the pool was forest basically. The noise was like nothing I'd ever heard, something between a yell and a yodel. Not really scary, but strange. I just watched the woods to see if I could get a look at whatever it was, but I didn't see anything, just heard that odd sound. A few weeks later, the first snow came. I stayed inside because I couldn't afford to get lost being on my own and everything. The next day, it was sunny, and I decided to first head out and plow the roads around the neighborhood. I'd learned by trial and error that if I let the plowing go too long, it'd be almost impossible to do it when it snowed again. Snow gets deep and packed in then, which wouldn't be a big deal since no one else was up there, but I couldn't really do my job if I couldn't go around checking on everything. I started up the truck in late morning and started driving around, plowing the few roads that snake around the hundred or so homes in the community. While I was plowing, I saw some tracks in the snow off the road. I'd seen tracks from coyotes, deer, and even bear, but these tracks were bigger. I couldn't see what they were though, and I didn't bother to get out of the truck to get a look. I didn't think much more about the tracks until one evening when I was walking on the newly plowed road. It was just beginning to get dark and I thought I should head back. As I turned around, I glanced toward the woods and saw something walking just outside the trees. At first I thought it was a person and I was scared. There wasn't supposed to be anyone out here. There wasn't any reason for anyone to be here and if they were here, they had to have hiked or come in by helicopter. You can't use those mountain roads in winter which is exactly why we closed the neighborhood. As I stared at it though, I could see it was too big and hairy to be a person. It was covered with hair or fur or something, but it wasn't an ape because it walked upright. Also, it was pretty far away, but I thought it was taller than a person, maybe eight or nine feet. I remembered the tracks then and wished I'd taken a picture of them. I was scared, but then I started to think that it must have been around for a while, and it hadn't hurt me, so why would it now? A few days later, I saw some tracks outside my house. This time, I did take a look at them and saw they looked like bare human feet. Only really big, like size 25 shoes maybe. I don't know. Right on my doorstep was a dead fish. At first, I was scared. Did this thing come right up to my house and leave me a dead fish? But then I started to think maybe it was a gift. Because it was fresh. And that creature must have gone to some trouble to get it since the lakes and streams were iced over. I took it inside and cooked it, and it was the best thing I'd eaten since fall. A few days later, it brought me a rabbit. That was a little gross, but what the heck? I found a video online on how to clean it and ate that too. It kept bringing me things all winter. Not every day, but every few days. And weirdly, I felt less alone. Once spring came, I didn't see any evidence of it anymore. 
It felt kind of lonely thinking it was gone, but I bet it'll be back this winter. I'm a forest ranger stationed in the Ozark Mountains, Arkansas. Been on the job for about a decade. It's been a regular enough life until one particular night last year. That's when things went odd. I was on a routine patrol following up on reports of strange animal noises and disturbances that had been troubling the local campers. We've got bears and bobcats, but this was different. Much odder. The first strange thing I noticed was an eerie silence that had settled in. No night critters making their usual noise. Felt like even the wind was holding its breath. Second, I found traces of unusual scat and prints, bigger than any native animals. Third, the forest trees. Those were damaged, broken, but not like normal storm damage. While the Ozarks are no stranger to storm damage, the trees I came across that night were different. They were not just knocked down, they were splintered, shredded. They looked as if something had torn through them, something big and powerful. More than that, the damage was high up, much higher than any bear could reach. It was as if a tornado had swept through, but only in a narrowly defined path. The sight was uncanny, and it chilled me more than the night air. That's when I saw it. The moon was full, providing enough light to see something massive ahead. It stood about six feet tall. Its body was shrouded in black feathers, obscuring most of it. As I approached, it unfurled wings large and bat-like, stretching wide across the forest floor. As the creature spread its wings, I could see how incredibly large they were, almost equal in size to its body. The moonlight filtered through the black, leathery material casting an eerie glow on the forest floor. They seem less like wings you'd find on a bird, and more like those you'd associate with bats, with visible veins and joints. I could hear a slight rustling of leaves and twigs under the creature's size and weight. The wings' sheer size and the sight of them opening up, filling the quiet forest with their presence, was an image that's been seared into my memory. Its face, or rather, the lack thereof was the part that really threw me off. No discernible facial features, just two large reflective red eyes that glowed ominously. I froze, heart hammering against my ribcage as those eyes locked onto mine. In that stillness, it was incredible how the eyes held my attention. They were too large to match any animal I knew, with a depth and intensity that was almost hypnotic. The red glow they emitted wasn't like the reflection of light you'd see in an animal caught in a headlight. Instead, they glowed with an internal luminescence reflecting off nothing, staring back at me with an awareness that was terrifying. It was as if they were seeing right through me. I could almost feel their gaze on my skin, raising goosebumps and causing a cold shiver to run down my spine. In the immediate aftermath, I scrambled backwards. Once I broke away from its gaze and stumbled back, I managed to pull my radio from my belt and call for backup. The signal was staticky and weak, just like my own shaken voice as I tried to describe what I'd seen. The eyes, the wings, the splintered trees, how do you put that into words? By the time my fellow rangers arrived with their headlights illuminating the scene, all that remained were the massive prints. The impressions were deep and large, much like the owner who'd left them behind. And though the creature had vanished, a faint, otherworldly screech still echoed around us, a chilling reminder of the encounter. Ever since then, I've been plagued with nightmares, of those glowing red eyes, of massive wings stirring up the forest floor. The encounter affected me more than I'd like to admit. The nights that followed were restless, haunted by dreams of large, glowing red eyes watching me from the dark corners of my room. Each sound in the night would set my heart racing, recalling the echo of massive wings and those eyes. I'd wake up in cold sweats, the image of the creature etched into my mind. I filed for a transfer soon after, wanting to get away from the forest and the memories it held. However, the slow grind of bureaucracy has left me stuck here, my request for transfer lost in a sea of paperwork. Meanwhile, every night spent here feels like a countdown, a dreaded anticipation of another encounter. 
Do what you will with this information, but please know that it is all true. Ever since I was young, I always wanted to be in the medical field. I was a certified nursing assistant, CNA, for a couple of years before I eventually entered medical school. I worked in a nursing home in a small town in Michigan. When you work in a nursing home, you essentially grow the size of your family. You become so close with them. You meet their family, learn about their lives, look forward to their stories, laugh with them, cry with them. And even though it's hard work, it's very rewarding. I can't tell you how many patients have told me that I was like a child to them. These patients will always have a special place in my heart. There was this lovely old woman named Mrs. Clark who was always full of life. She always wore this old red hat and her teeth were terrible. Despite these quirks, she was by far one of my favorite patients. About two weeks before she died, she would talk about these three little girls that were following her around. Every time I would check on her, she would have new stories about what these three little girls recently did. As she told it, they'd say crazy things to her, make her laugh, show her their toys, and she always had a new story about these girls. I never saw any of these girls, obviously. I figured it was just her dementia playing tricks on her mind at the time. Then Mrs. Clark passed and it was one of the hardest deaths I've had to deal with as a CNA. Then a new patient, Mrs. McCon and I, ended up moving into her room. She was a very calm and cheerful old woman. She always had a smile on her face and never caused any problems. She was gentle as a lamb and being in her presence was very soothing. She reminded me of my own grandmother and I would always spend extra time with her. Then, all of a sudden, Mrs. McConaughey started talking to me about three little girls that would visit her. They would tell her about their days. They would bring her toys, tell her jokes, and dance around her bed. Every time I visited her room, she had a new story about these three little girls. It was too coincidental, and I started to really listen intently to Mrs. McConaughey when she would talk about these three little girls. I knew for a fact that there weren't any actual young girls that were visiting her. Initially, I thought there had to be someone's daughters that would visit the nursing home, but only Mrs. Makanagi was seeing them. Then Mrs. McConaugh passed away. Shortly after that, we had the next patient move into a room named Mr. Mason. Mr. Mason was awesome. He was really kind-hearted and jovial. He was always a gentleman, and he would tell the best stories from his past. Most people his age like to tell the same stories over and over again, but Mr. Mason always had a new amazing story to tell. He was really funny and could always get the whole room laughing. He was very active in the nursing home activities and everyone just loved him. A couple of weeks before he died, Mr. Mason started mentioning the three little girls. He would talk about how he loved how playful they were and how happy they always were. This really freaked me out. He was the third patient in a row to talk about these girls. Nobody else in the nursing home was telling stories about these three girls. It was just the patients in that particular room. It was very unsettling. Then one night, my coworker Sarah and I were both assisting Mr. Mason in getting ready for bed. All of a sudden, he asks me, who's that standing next to you? I replied, don't be silly, Mr. Mason. You know Sarah, you see her all the time. He shook his head and said no, the other one standing next to her. Sarah and I both looked at each other and I could feel the adrenaline shoot through my limbs. This was getting to be too much. In fact, it was becoming absolutely terrifying. Mr. Mason passed away later that evening and I relocated shortly after that but couldn't get these three girls out of my mind. Years later, I made a shocking discovery. I was visiting friends down the street from that nursing home and learned that there had been a terrible fire at the location years before the nursing home was built. There was a barn that caught fire and three little girls were burned alive. I'm sure my eyes went wide when I learned those facts, but I kept my thoughts to myself knowing that my story would never sound possible. When you work with the sick and the elderly, you develop a unique relationship with death and energy. Strange things often happen to people when their time comes, and I feel like pretty much every nurse has some crazy story to tell. But I think about those three little girls a lot. I wish that before I moved away from Michigan, I could have done something to help those girls move on into the next life. 
Before I die, I would like to return to that room and at least tell them that it's okay to move on. I'm no supernatural expert, but I know that something is keeping them from moving on into the afterworld. The face Mr. Mason made when he asked who was beside Sarah was really disturbing. I'm thinking that whatever whoever he saw is what is keeping them there. I hope I can figure it out. I'm not the type to believe in monsters or any of that nonsense. At least I wasn't until a couple years back when things took a really weird turn. I'm a surveyor by trade. I was out in the thick of the Colorado wilderness, marking boundaries for a client looking to build. Beautiful country, but damn lonely, miles from any kind of civilization. I remember it being a day like any other clear skies and a slight chill in the air. That day, I was mapping out the south section of the client's property. I always enjoyed working that area. It offered great views, a lively creek, and the sound of birds trilling in the distance. The landscape was a mix of rolling meadows and dense pine forests, untouched and pristine. The seclusion didn't bother me. It gave me peace, a chance to get away from the usual city noise. It felt like my own slice of paradise, which was probably why I was caught so off guard when the day took a drastic turn. Honestly, I wasn't looking for anything out of the ordinary that day. Just doing my job with my head stuck in data and measurements. But as dusk fell, that's when it started. I remember a smell like rotting meat. Stomach turning, even for a guy who'd worked around roadkill before. It wasn't until I was deep in the forest, a good two miles from my truck, that the smell really hit me. It was putrid, as if the entire ecosystem was rotting away. My first thought was maybe a bear had taken down something big, like an elk, and I just stumbled into the aftermath. But this was something else, something I couldn't quite place. I felt it in the pit of my stomach, a warning sign of some sort. The normal hum of the forest seemed to quiet down, as if the birds and bugs were reacting to the same gut-wrenching odor. It was at that point I realized this wasn't just another day at work. Something was off, very off. Then, in the failing light, I saw something. Big, nine feet tall, easy. I thought it was a dead tree at first, a really gnarly one. But trees don't change their location. And this thing did. It had the legs of an elk, long and sturdy, but something was horribly wrong. The skin was hanging off like it was rotting away. As my eyes adjusted to the encroaching darkness, I tried to make sense of the figure in the distance. At first, it seemed to blend with the trees so tall and skeletal. The antlers made it seem like a bizarre, grotesque statue, an artifact of nature worn by time and weather. I saw the flesh hanging loosely from its frame, revealing a skeletal structure beneath. It was as if the animal had been dead for months and was just an upright carcass. That's when a chilling gust of wind brought another wave of that terrible smell and the creature shifted on its elk-like legs. I watched as this nightmarish figure detached from the tree line and moved towards me, becoming horribly real. The head is what really got me. Like a deer skull, antlers and all, but with two empty holes where the eyes should have been. Except they weren't empty, Donovan. They were glowing, flickering between this unnatural yellow and an angry, burning red I remember the feeling of my heart thumping against my ribs as I watched this thing, this impossible creature turn its head towards me. The skull-like face was a horrifying sight. The antlers added a certain sinister elegance, but those empty eye sockets, they were something straight out of a horror movie. Suddenly they lit up, first a piercing yellow illuminating the surrounding woods with a sickly glow. Then they switched to a malevolent red casting an unsettling hue onto the decaying flesh that hung off its body. The sight of those shifting lights where I should have been, that's what kick-started my adrenaline and jolted me out of my stupor. What could I do? I was in shock and couldn't move. Then when the shock wore off, I ran. I didn't stop till I hit my truck, locked the doors, turned the key and got the hell out of there. Never been so scared in my life. My work for that client? Unfinished. And I never went back for it. 
Since then, I've been a changed man. I now keep a close watch on my surroundings. So make this a note to you too. Be aware, because if there's something like that out there, who knows what else might be hiding in the shadows. Ever since that night, I've found myself constantly looking over my shoulder, both in the wilderness and in the city. I try to convince myself it was just a hallucination, a trick of the light, but the memory is too vivid, too real. I've started studying local wildlife trying to match what I saw to some known creature, but nothing fits. I've taken up self-defense classes, even bought myself a sturdy hunting knife, just in case. I can't escape the feeling that I've seen something unnatural, something unexplained. It's taught me that the world is a lot bigger and stranger than we think, and that there are still mysteries out there waiting to be discovered, even if they're the kind you'd rather never encounter. 